Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me again. Today, we're covering a very interesting topic, specifically on building large language model powered applications and why you should not be building large language pow model powered applications without first knowing about RAG. RAG, of course, stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. I was recently at an AWS natural language processing convention, and I would say about 80% of the engineers that I spoke to at the convention were either building RAG enabled large language model applications or exploring the potential for using RAG enabled large language model applications within their businesses. In the large language model community, I would say that RAG right now is definitely in vogue. And I wouldn't call it all just hype. There are good reasons why RAG is in vogue. And we're going to explore some of that today in this short video. To understand why RAG is in vogue, it makes sense to start looking at the, some of the limitations of large language models as of today. Many of you would have already played around with large language models through products like ChatGPT, of course, which is a very popular interface for using the model behind it, which is either GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 at the time of recording this video. But what are some of the limitations of ChatGPT? Before continuing with the rest of this video, I'd like to take a quick pause to briefly introduce the artificial intelligence course that we are developing. If you are a data professional, software engineer, software developer, student, or even somebody just looking to make a career transition, this might just be the thing for you. There is a massive skill shortage in people that have the right skills to move artificial intelligence forward in many businesses. This course aims to address that by providing you with hands-on skills to enable you to build your own large language model applications. If this sounds good to you, I invite you to sign up and join the waiting list. Visit the link in the description to this video and register your interest. A great example here is if we want to ask ChatGPT something that is about current events, what do I mean by this? We know that there was a banking crisis earlier this year in 2023. Some of you might have explored a bit about this banking crisis, but there was a few US banks that failed. If we were to ask ChatGPT now, please, could you tell me the first bank to fail in the 2023 banking crisis? We would get a response from the model saying that it's unable to answer that query because the data that the model was trained on only goes up to September 2021. Obviously, the 2023 banking crisis happened after that point. So essentially, the model has no knowledge of the events of the 2023 banking crisis. Some of you might say, well, okay, that's all well and good, but can't I just copy and paste some information source about the 2023 banking crisis into ChatGPT's context and have it answer the question based on that. And yes, you can do that. But what happens is the knowledge base that we have, the information we have on the 2023 banking crisis, which is coming from a Wikipedia article, turns out to exceed the maximum context length available in ChatGPT. So if you tried to do that and ask the model to answer the question with the context paste in, in the window, what's going to happen is the model is going to respond to you saying, this is too long. Please, could you reduce the length of the prompt? Obviously, that's no use to us in business applications. And really, nobody wants to start manually filtering down the context and then pasting it into ChatGPT just to find the answer to a question. This is where RAG comes in. It turns out that RAG is a really effective solution 
for performing this type of task where there is some kind of knowledge base with the information you want and you want to query that knowledge base you want to ask questions of that knowledge base using a large language model rag pipelines are quite easy to implement at the prototype level anyway i think there's difficulties when it comes to scaling but that's or that's another topic of discussion they're quite cheap to implement and they are effective in dealing with the issues we run into. So the issue of lack of training beyond a certain point and the issue of longer context. Let's explore this a, a bit more in a little bit more detail by understanding how RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation actually works under the hood. You can conceptualize Retrieval Augmented Generation in three parts. The first part is what you call the knowledge base. The knowledge base consists of the documents that you would like the large language model to be able to retrieve from. So that's the source of information that contains, you know, whether it's information about your 2023 banking crisis or whether you have some, you're a lawyer and you have some legal contracts that has some important information in there that you would like to pull or you're a manufacturer and you have some recipes that you'd like to pull from. That's your knowledge base. So the first part is converting that knowledge base into a form that is easy to search and retrieve over. And it turns out you can easily do this by converting it into a, a vector form. I go into more details about the vector forms in some technical blogs I've written, and I'll link those at the in the description for this video. So we have our vector form, which is convenient to do search and retrieval over. The next thing we want to do is actually build a tool that can perform search and retrieval. And this is quite straightforward. And there are frameworks that exist out there like Haystack and Langchain that enable you to build search and retrieval pipelines quite easily. So what's a search and retrieval pipeline? The first part is the search. So we have our knowledge base arranged in vector form and stored in vector form. We can perform a similarity search based on the query that we receive and the knowledge base, which is now, of course, stored in vector form. The similarity search looks and identifies the most similar parts of that knowledge base to our query. Essentially, what we're doing here is we're taking a long context and shortening it by providing only the relevant information or isolating and selecting only the relevant information. I won't go into the details of how similarity search works in this video. I will probably do something more detailed on similarity search at a later point in time. But for now, just keep in mind that all we're doing here is we're taking the query and we're matching that to the knowledge base and finding the most relevant parts of the knowledge base that could potentially answer that query. The second part is using a question answer model. So a question answer model has been trained or pre-trained on question answer pairs. So what it will do is it will look at that, the, the documents that we've isolated or the parts of the knowledge base we've isolated that are similar to our query. And the question answer model will be able to extract the answer to the query from those uh, that isolated or the selected relevant parts of the knowledge base. So that's our retrieval tool in total. So we've talked about two things. We've talked about first the, the knowledge base, which is converted to a vector form, which allows us to be able to perform search and retrieval over it easily. And then we've talked about the search and retrieval tool itself, which is two parts, the retriever, which creates, um, which isolates a part of the knowledge base that are relevant to answering our question. And then the question answer model, which actually supplies the answer to the question based on those relevant parts of the knowledge base. Great. So there's a third part to it. And this third part isn't completely necessary, but I would say for higher performance apps, for applications that are able to answer more complex questions, this is really where the magic happens. We have a large language model powered agent. Now, why is the agent 
so powerful. The agent is, is um, given all of the reasoning capability that a large language model has. The agent also has the ability to use the tool, the retriever tool that we defined earlier in the last step. So the agent will take the query, it can comprehend the query. So the query might be something like what was the first bank to fail in the 2023 banking crisis. The agent then knows that it needs to, because it's powered by a large language model, it knows that it needs to use the retriever tool to be able to find the answer to that. So it will then create an input into the retriever tool, asking that question. And then the retrieval tool will provide an answer to that question. Now, the magic comes in here because the agent is also able to interpret the answer to that question and understand whether it's actually a response that makes sense for the query that we've asked. So an agent is almost like, it's almost like a mediator um, that makes sure the tool is being used correctly to provide an answer. Oh, there are obvious limitations to this because agents hallucinate and the agent doesn't necessarily even know the answer here because it is powered by the large language model. But it's an intermediate step that allows us to ask more complex questions. Once the agent's happy that it's received a response, a, a valid response from the retrieval tool, the agent outputs that back to the, the user that asked the query and you'll get your response. So in a nutshell, that's a really high level overview of retrieval augmented generation. If retrieval augmented generation is starting to sound like a silver bullet to you, I wouldn't be doing my job properly if I didn't dispel that myth immediately. So let's talk about some of the lim limitations of RAG or retrieval augmented generation. The first big limitation is something that might have come to you, but it's actually evaluating the efficacy of your retrieval augmented generation enabled large language model. That was a mouthful. How do you evaluate the performance of such a, such a system? Where the complexity comes in here is that you have multiple components interacting with each other. Let's look at the retriever tool, for example. The retrieval tool has two components. It has the search, the retrieval bit, and it has the question answering bit. You can evaluate those separately. So there are benchmark data sets to evaluate information retrieval, and there are also benchmark data sets to evaluate question answering. However, there is an interaction between those two, two components. And the worse your retrieval performs, the worse your, your um, question answer ring is going to perform too. You can imagine it's, it's common sense, right? If you have a retriever tool that doesn't retrieve the right or the, the relevant documents, your question answering tool isn't going to deliver the right answers because it's just working off wrong information. The other thing to consider with evaluation is that the benchmark data sets that you're evaluating your retriever and question answering models on might not reflect your the actual business application you're building the um, RAG enabled large language model application for. It might not reflect it at all. Benchmark data sets, for example, might be based on just general knowledge at Q and A, but you might be building something that's working off. Uh, legal documents. So that isn't going to be relevant. And you don't necessarily know if that performance translates over into the legal domain. Therefore, for business applications, you might have to construct your own evaluation data sets, which can be very tricky and time consuming. Moving on from just model considerations, the other major thing um, and this is something I picked up from the AWS conference is on the user interface and the user experience. A lot of the challenge around retrieval augmented generation and RAG enabled LLMs is that 
it can return a response to you. And even if you're able to evaluate, even if you're able to put a number on the accuracy of the response, you still cannot really tell just by its, by the response alone, you can't tell whether that model is returning you something that is factually correct or whether something's gone wrong in your pipeline and it's hallucinating or it's just retrieved the wrong thing. The way a lot of engineers are dealing with this is to present a very transparent user interface. What do I mean by this? Instead of just returning a response to the query, transparency comes from actually providing citations. So you'll provide a, the, the model or the tool will provide a response to the query, but it will also provide a citation and pinpoint exactly where it's pulled the information from. And that will give the user a better appreciation of the context from which this answer was generated. And it will also enable you to use a bit of your own common sense reasoning to say, okay, that doesn't make sense actually for the question I was answering or, oh, that makes complete sense. So the user interface is really key here and the user experience that is going to put an additional safeguard on top of your retrieval augmented generation pipeline to ensure that users aren't being delivered false or inaccurate responses and not having any chance or there's not not seeing any context around that to be able to discern for themselves whether they should trust what the model is saying or not. I could go into a lot more detail on the user interface, but I think I'll save that for another video. Just to conclude here, Retrieval augmented, retrieval augmented generation is very powerful. It's really useful. It is something that's quite easy to develop right now. All the frameworks are out there. Obviously, there are challenges that come with scaling tools. So if you're just doing this over 10 documents, it's obviously a lot easier to do than if you're having to do this over hundreds of thousands of documents. That's a different problem in itself. That's a software engineering problem, and it's about scale. It's not a silver bullet. So there are challenges and, you know, primary challenges are around evaluating your retrieval augmented generation system and also designing the user interface and the user experience such that it's transparent, enabling the user to discern whether the, the responses it's getting from the tool should be trusted or not. Those are the, the significant challenges. Saying that, if you have not heard of Retrieval Augmented Generation, um, hopefully now you have a better understanding of what it is and why it is so powerful for building large language model-based applications. If you found this video insightful, I would invite you to subscribe to the channel. I'll be delivering more content on large language models, artificial intelligence, and data science. I would also invite you to leave a thumbs up on the video. It helps the algorithm to distribute this more widely. Thanks for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next time.